My name is uh, Dr. Michael Murphy and I'm a Christian psychologist and it's my great pleasure to talk to you tonight about uh, developmental psychology or lifespan development. Uh, the reason it's uh, a great topic to talk about is uh, some of the greatest psychologists of the 20th century have been uh, lifespan developmental psychologists and I actually had a chance to work with many of them when I was at Harvard uh, back in the 1970s. Uh, tonight we'll talk a little bit about Carol Gilligan, Larry Kohlberg, James Fowler, Bill Perry, and Eric Erickson. First a few words about myself. I am a uh, staff member at Mass General Hospital in Boston where I see patients. I'm an assistant professor, associate professor at the Harvard Medical School and the uh, president of New Life Christian Counseling Center here in Waltham. I belong to several Christian society, psychology societies and I have the opportunity to travel a lot and do research uh, all around the world. So uh, the notion that uh, people change over the lifespan is not a new one. Uh, we can find it uh, easily in the Bible. St. Paul, who some people have said was the first psychologist, observed that when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood, uh, put the ways of childhood behind me. So this idea very clearly in St. Paul shows that uh, there's a difference between the way children uh, speak and think and the way that adults uh, think. Uh, what is that difference? Well, in some ways, that's the question of uh, lifespan developmental psychology. Uh, we also see that in the Hindu tradition, there's a very clear notion that there are different stages in life, from the apprentice to the householder, forest dweller, uh, renouncer. Um, so let me outline the subject and the topic of the, the talk tonight a little bit. Uh, we'll take, uh, talk about the perspective of lifespan development, uh, the scientific method and how that uh, plays into this, uh, child and lifespan developmental theories, and applications and implications for family counseling. So we're talking about the science of human development, which hopefully squares with our experience. Uh, and we have to point out that we, we began studying children and realized that the studying people over time uh, was also appropriate up into adolescence and even adulthood. Um, so we're trying to understand how people uh, change over time. Uh, there's a lot of different areas of lifespan development. We talk about physical development, mental development, social, and even spiritual development. Is it nature or nurture? What, what shapes us? Is it what we're born with or uh, what happens to us? And the answer is, of course, both. Nature refers to the influence of genes which we inherit. Nurture refers to environmental influences such as health, diet, family, church, school, community, and society. Development is multi-directional. It goes up, it goes down, it goes backwards and forward. Uh, in stages of development, it goes forward, and we have the stage theories of Freud, Erickson, and Piaget. Uh, we have development as a continuous process. We're always adjusting and adapting to our environments. Development is multi multicultural. Um, people who have different ancestries uh, develop in different ways. Pat patterns of behavior are passed from one generation to the next. And this development can be studied multidisciplinarily. Genetics and neuroscience are two of the newer disciplines in lifespan research. So I'll talk a little bit about theories of human development. Um, and then a theory is an orderly set of ideas which describe, explain, and predict behavior. Why do we have theories? They give meaning to what we observe and they're a basis for action. Uh, they also let us test out uh, what we see and find out if our theories are correct. If we have a theory, we can, see, we can see whether we understand what's going on. And as I hope to talk a little later today, uh, the notion of development, that things change over time, should help us to be, become better uh, counselors. So uh, the development itself has developed and uh, from St. Paul having a pretty good and modern 
uh, view of development, we would say, uh, through the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages in the West, uh, we lost some of that notion. Uh, the no so even though we began tonight by saying that uh, St. Paul saw children as little as uh, different from adults, uh, in the Middle Ages people began to picture children as just little adults and they didn't realize that uh, they were different. So we had, uh, they dressed in adults clothing, they worked at adult jobs, they could be hanged or imprisoned as, uh, as if they were adults, uh, they could be kings, they could be married, and so there wasn't much difference between children and adults and there wasn't a notion of, de of development. Uh, as we got closer to the more modern era, the uh, Puritan religion uh, influenced uh, us to a great degree in the U.S. Uh, the Puritan view was that people were born evil and they had to be civilized. Uh, we reached the age of enlightenment, perhaps, and uh, began to realize that people, that children responded to nurturing. And uh, then in the 18th and 19th century, there was the age of reason, so-called, and people began to uh, realize that children uh, could be uh, taught and molded into adults. So now we reach the 20th century, and how were children viewed in the 20th century? Uh, theories of children's development expanded around the world, childhood was seen as worthy of special attention, and many, many laws were passed to protect children. Child labor laws, uh, laws against abuse and neglect. It's one of my favorite slides because as we study human beings, and we're going to study the development of human beings, uh, we see that there are many, many views of human beings. We can study their minds, their morality, their faith, we can study the way they learn, their psychosexual development, their psychosocial development, their motivation. All are valid views of human beings and all lead us to notice different things and to uh, give us different opportunities to help people. So in some ways, uh, no talk about psychology should uh, leave out Sigmund Freud, whose Im Im influence on the field was immense. Uh, Freud had a psychosexual theory, which was very controversial, uh, but was very productive for, for scientists and also for clinicians who were treating people. For Freud, uh, there was a notion that uh, there was an irrational subconscious mind in childhood and that uh, over the course of uh, development, people had to go through different stages. So. Um, Uh, here's an example of Freud's stages. Zero to one was the oral stage, when the whole uh, the child's whole world revolved around uh, nursing and their 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 mouth, uh, and they they viewed the world uh, as a one big breast in Freud's mind. Then from ages one to three, um, we have the anal stage when uh, they were being toilet trained, and again their whole being revolved around withholding or getting rid of their feces. And so this was a pretty uh, raunchy view of human beings and uh, it caused a lot of concern on the part of many people, especially religious people. And then in the phallic stage, uh, we're talking about children aged three to six, they discovered their genitals. And so again, the, the pleasure that they felt in touching themselves or being diapered uh, became a major factor. Uh, then for Freud, from ages 6 to 12 years of age, uh, people's sexuality went underground and it was latent, it wasn't visible. And this was also called the age of industry for Freud, where children scurried about learning things about the world and uh, kind of went underground. And then at age 12, we had the genital stage where the uh, human beings were actually capable of sexual uh, interaction with each other. Uh, hopefully not until adulthood, but uh, even in adolescence it was possible. Uh, so one of Freud's students was a psychologist named Eric Erickson, who I had the pleasure to meet uh, and interview several times. And he expanded Freud's theory a, a great deal and brought in a lot more about culture, development, and it was a much more, uh, it's a, it, was a life, it was the first lifespan developmental 
theory, because if you remember Freud's theory ended at age 12, and that was about as far as uh, he, he took it. But for Erickson, it was a lifespan developmental theory. So as you can see here on the slide, uh, he begins with the same kind of stages that Freud had at age zero and age one to three, age three. Uh, but he, he, uh, he took his theory all the way up to age 65 and older. So uh, he, his uh, theory revolved around these polarities. So uh, initiative versus guilt was the issue that uh, three to six year olds were facing. Industry versus inferiority. Uh, the famous identity crisis in the middle of the the, sh the chart there, age 12 to 20. For Erickson, uh, the young person growing up had to find his or her identity, and if they didn't, if they didn't have a clear sense of who they were, uh, culturally, sexually, uh, career-wise, they might uh, uh, be confused about their roles, and so it was very the task of uh, of ad adolescence was to find one's identity. Uh, then for Erickson in this uh, sort of Western male dominated image, uh, the next stage was intimacy and isolation. Okay, you've found your career, you're going to be a doctor, and now who are you going to marry? And then once you're married in your 30s or 30 to 60, you're in the stage of generativity. You're, you're working in the hospital, you're educating your children, uh, and then finally after age 65, this is a stage of integrity versus despair. If you'd lived a good life and things had come together for you, well, then you felt a sense of integrity. And if you'd uh, not been able to succeed in those ways, uh, you might have despair. And just a personal note is I've been working with one gentleman who's now in his 80s, and uh, I had the pleasure of working with him for about 20 years. And he, he really is experiencing this uh, this stage. So he's, he's, his body is breaking down, his kids are grown, uh, and he's really trying to figure out who he was and who he's going to be in the last few years of his life. Uh, he's a, a practicing Catholic, a good Christian, uh, but there's been a lot of depression, a lot of uh, tragedy in his life. Uh, he's made some bad decisions, and he's uh, trying to find himself, trying to figure out what did it all mean? What was my life about. I, th I think he's going to come up with a, a good picture, but it's been a real struggle for him. Um, so this, in this way, Erickson's theory was a, was a great theory because it, it really spoke to the kinds of things that we see in the clinic and, and in our lives. Uh, it was a, a lifespan developmental theory. Here's a, a more a detailed uh, vision of it. We begin in infancy in the top and early childhood play age uh, going downward. There's a conflict, as I said, uh, about my patient integrity versus despair. If my patient resolves it well, if you're reading the bottom line on the chart, he reaches wisdom in Erickson's theory. If he doesn't resolve it, uh, again, maybe he stays in despair. Uh, so he's looking for his existential identity. Going to the middle of the chart, mo where most of us are, uh, adulthood, generativity versus stagnation. If we've found a way to be active and involved in the world, we are generative, whether we're raising a family or running a department or running a store or having a business, uh, we're, we're generating, we're creating. And the, uh, the virtue that comes out of that stage is care. We care for the world, whatever we do, as long as we're involved. But if we're not involved because of mental illness or uh, physical illness, we stagnate. And many of my patients who are depressed stagnate. Their, their lives are very empty. They, they live alone. They don't do very much. They're not, nobody needs them for anything. Uh, they're not under stress to produce the way many of us are. But on the other hand, they're not woven into the fabric of life. Uh, so that's a, 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 they're not able to achieve the, the virtue of care. Um, for our audience here, one of uh, Erickson's heroes was Gandhi. And Erickson attempted a mighty task when he wrote a book about Gandhi called Gandhi's Truth. So his uh, attempt was to write a psychology, a, a stage psychology that could fit uh, a, a man as great as, as Gandhi. And so he, he, in the book, he traces how Gandhi went through those stages that we just looked at. But Gandhi is a political figure, a religious figure, uh, 
somebody who you have to understand spirituality to understand. Uh, and so uh, this was a Pulitzer Prize winning book in 1969. So you can see that from the ages, uh, the age of Freud in the early 1900s, talking about the uh, oral stage and the anal stage and early childhood, uh, Erickson, 50 or 60 years later, has taken the theory to, to become a lifespan, multicultural, uh, strong theory that in, can encompass great leaders like Erickson, like uh, Gandhi. Uh, so these are theories about psychosocial and psychosexual development. Uh, we can talk about cognitive theories, uh, just as we see that uh, children uh, can grow physically, their minds grow. And so it was the great uh, Piaget who came up with some of the first uh, cognitive theories. And the notion that children, young children really can't understand some of the things that we understand. And that the only way they can come to understand those things is by going through a series of stages. So here are the Piagetian stages. We begin the sensory motor. Remember we said the uh, child had a, an oral stage and an anal stage. So the child was very much involved with his or her senses and his motoric behavior. So in this, the world of the birth to two year old, uh, the, the cognition is, is very limited and it's only about uh, concrete things and things that can be sensed. Uh, from ages two to seven, the child begins to use me mental representation and is able to think in a kind of simple way. Like Piaget called that the pre-operational phase. And then by the time the child reached seven, in the Catholic Church we call this the age of reason, the child is really able to think and use logical operations and principles to solve problems. Then for Piaget, one of the great achievements of Piaget was to realize that there was something beyond age 11, formal operations, the ability to think about thinking. And uh, this is very important when we're dealing clinically with adolescents because they've, they've, it's like giving a Ferrari to a, a teenager too. Their, their minds are very powerful and they've just learned how to use them. And they can argue you out of anything or try to argue their way out of anything. Uh, so we can get exasperated with them but it's really just them using the uh, talents and the skills that are available to them. So again, here's Piaget's cognitive theory of development, sensory motor, pre-operational, uh, formal operational. So uh, this is a stage theory. So I'm going to skip ahead in my slides. Uh, one of the most important things I'm going to say is that a stage theory implies differences not just in degree, but in form. So the classic example is of a, of a butterfly or of a frog and a tadpole. A caterpillar, the, uh, the butterfly begins as a, an egg and then as a caterpillar. And so if we went to a caterpillar and we wanted it to fly, it couldn't because it hasn't achieved the state of full development. So a stage theory says there are certain things you can and cannot do at each, at each stage, and they're irreversible. A pupa or a full-grown butterfly can't go backward and become a caterpillar. And similarly, a caterpillar can't do the things that a pupa or an adult butterfly can do. Uh, with frogs, you can see it, an even better example. A frog begins as an egg, and it can only do what eggs can do. Then it's a tadpole, then it's a tadpole with legs, then it's a frog with a tail, and finally it's a frog without his tail. And again, these stages are inexorable. They're not a matter of uh, choice. We can't ask the, uh, the tadpole to walk around on land, and we can't ask the uh, frog to live under water. So one of the great uh, contributions of developmental theory has to been to see that certain things in human development are stages. Uh, so the uh, Piagetian child cannot do formal algebra and the adult who can do algebra doesn't think simply about concrete uh, things. So the stage theory of development uh, is one of the contributions of developmental theory. And these are some diagrams that illustrate different types of development. Some development as in the picture on the left is a straight line. Some, like I was just saying, are stages 
which are a threshold that you cross that you can't go back, and some are happening over time. You can learn music as a child and lose it and then learn it again and um, learn to do certain mathematical operations and forget them. Uh, so certain things are not stages, certain things are just things that we learn and experience. This is just a, a growth chart, a human growth chart, gra graphing height by age, and it illustrates that uh, it, it's a smooth non-stage theory, that basically over time most people get taller and taller uh, up into adulthood. So that's a non-stage theory. Uh, Lawrence Kohlberg brought uh, stage theory to moral development, and if you ever want to read a very interesting uh, set of uh, books, uh, Kohlberg's work is, is a great thing to look at because he talked about the way moral thinking and moral reasoning can develop. Now obviously moral action is not the same as moral reasoning, but moral reasoning probably is part of uh, moral action. So what Kohlberg noticed is that uh, to a child, simple right and wrong uh, is all that matters. But with an adult we can say, well, that person's action was wrong, but he meant well. So Kohlberg mapped the uh, stages of moral development. And these are his uh, stages, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. And he also relied on uh, not only uh, Piaget, but also on Erickson. So uh, he, Gandhi was at his highest stage, and uh, maybe Eleanor Roosevelt, and uh, people like that were at the highest stage. Uh, uh, some of the great Christian prophets were too. So they uh, they acted because they ha they had a uh, a principled view of morality. Jim Fowler, who I also met, uh, had a, applied Kohlberg's theory of moral development to the stages of the development of faith. And so for uh, for Fowler, you could look at the faith of a child, which would be different than the faith of an adolescent, which would be different than the faith of a young adult, which would be different than a faith of a, a mature, wise, old adult, if there is such a thing. Uh, another person I met briefly, a very important thinker, is Abraham Maslow, who had a motivational theory of development. Uh, and here's the very famous hierarchy of needs. If you look at the bottom of the chart, physiological, we all uh, are going to attend to breathing and food and water first. Uh, but when those needs are met, the physiological needs, we worry about our safety. When our safety needs, uh, protecting ourselves, having a job are met, we can think about relationships. And uh, now that I have a basic uh, security in the world, uh, I'd like to fall in love. And then after that, maybe we, we want to earn self-esteem or the respect of others. And then finally at the top, uh, reminiscent in some ways of Kohlberg's and uh, Erickson's theories, is self-actualization. For, for Maslow, uh, people uh, who had reached this higher stage were self-actualized. So they're not playing to the crowd, they're not being swayed by uh, what, what people want them to do. They're following their own inner moral compass. I'm going to briefly talk on some of the other theories. You know, we've spent a lot of time talking about developmental theories and motivational theories, but um, even more important probably in the 20th century has been behavioral and learning theories. So we have John Watson, the father of behaviorism, B.F. Skinner, the uh, op uh, father of operant conditioning, Albert Bandura, who taught about social learning. So these psychologists studied the way we could program human beings. Uh, this kind of uh, theory was not very popular when I was in college because it sounded so robotic. But the truth is that most of modern psychology, or a good portion of it now, is things like uh, CBT, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, and DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy. And these are very uh, uh, effective strategies for getting over phobias or social anxiety uh, by breaking these uh, fears down into smaller chunks, people are actually able to uh, uh, reprogram themselves so they can speak in public or get on an airplane or ride an elevator. Uh, biology has been a, a huge uh, force in the 20th and 21st 
century. Social cultural theory, Vygotsky, coming out of Eastern Europe. Systems theory, especially ecological systems theory, is another way to, going back to our elephant, these are people that look at human uh, psychology as a system, and if you push on one part of the system, uh, one place something will happen someplace else. So they can view uh, humans uh, from a systemic point of view and as ecological systems. Uh, Yuri Bronfenbrenner at Cornell is uh, one of the proponents of this. Uh, if you look at this, again, you, you, you can. these are different ways of looking at at human beings. So you can look at the micro system, that's the activities and interaction in the child's immediate surroundings. The meso system, relationships uh, in the child's micro system. Parents' interaction with teachers, a school's interaction with the daycare provider. Exo system, social institutions. Macro system, broader cultural values. Chrono system, changes which occur over time. Uh, so one child growing up uh, in, in Iraq uh, is going to have a very different course of development than the same child would have uh, if there had been no Iraq war. So all of these things can be modeled as changes in the uh, ecological system. So we've covered a lot of theories, uh, psychosocial, psychoanalytic theories, which include psychosexual and psychosocial, behavioral and social learning theories, biological theories, cognitive theories, systems theories. There's a lot of different ways to look at human development and some of the richest and most uh, effective uh, ways of looking at people have come out of the psychology, these psychologies of the 20th century. So um, I'd just like to talk a little bit about applications of these theories. Uh, talk about if you work with kids, uh, I think we've really shown in this brief time together that uh, Children are very different over time, from their early childhood to the middle childhood, to their teen years, to their early adulthood. And we have to be sensitive to where they're at. Uh, we can't lecture to kids as if they were other adults. And so anybody that works with children and families needs to appreciate uh, the, the difference of different ages of kids. Uh, kids change in their bodies and their minds and their, their social relationships emotionally and in their spiritual development too. It's the faith of a young child is very different than the faith of a teenager, a young adult, or older adult. Uh, this is, we're going to review some of the, the differences in children. We'll just go through them quickly. Uh, five to seven year olds, is a, as we said, is an age of industry uh, for kids. They're starting to learn uh, the world, and then eight to ten year olds are getting more comfortable getting out. They're getting larger physically, they're starting to have friends, uh, they're learning self responsibility, greater cognitive skills, and these keep growing as the kids age. The teen years, uh, and again, psychologists have mapped all these changes. So this is a lifespan development. You can pick any age and any system. Um, this is middle adulthood, biological. Uh, all of these uh, ages and stages influence children and, and we can be aware of where they're at when we interact with them. I want to spend the last couple minutes uh, of my talk talking about the greatest developmental study there ever was, I think, uh, and its wonderful results. One reason I said we study this stuff is that we want to be able to help people more effectively. And uh, so this is the longest and most ambitious study ever done, and luckily the results are in. So this was something called the Grant Study because the man who funded it was the founder of the W.T. Grant uh, uh, five and ten cent store uh, chain, so he was a millionaire who wanted to do something good with his money. So he went to Harvard and he said that he'd like to study uh, healthy people. Enough of this uh, studying of depression and uh, mass murderers. Why can't we study healthy people and find out how they develop? So they set up a study in the late 1930s at Harvard and they selected 237 physically and mentally healthy Harvard College sophomores from the classes of the 1939 to 1944, otherwise known over here as the greatest generation. 
So these were the, the boys that eventually fought in the Second World War, but before the war they were at Harvard. And then they added a second study that was just by coincidence also done in Boston at almost the same time of inner city, lower class boys. So both of these are about boys and men. Uh, there actually have been some studies of women that we won't have a chance to talk about, I don't think, but let me tell you a little bit about what was learned from studying these men uh, over a 50 or 60 year time. The, uh, the guy who really put this study on the map is George Valen. You see a picture of him there. He wrote four or five or six books. Adaptation to Life is the most famous one. He did a, a wonderful work on alcoholism, studying the way these 200 men, be, some of them became alcoholics and some of them recovered from it. He wrote some books, Aging Well, and he even was very interested in spiritual evolution. Uh, Dr. Valen is a practicing Christian and a really smart and wonderful guy. He's mostly retired now. Uh, so just to tell you who they became, uh, with the subtitle of the book is How the Best and the Brightest Came of Age. Uh, again, a lot of cultural biases, uh, gender biases, uh, but these were the greatest generation uh, kids and uh, John F. Kennedy, the future president of the United States, was in the sample. Six future U.S. senators, one state governor, a Pulitzer Prize winning publisher, uh, ben Bradley, the editor of the Washington Post, and two men who became internationally famous were rejected because they weren't healthy enough, Leonard Bernstein, the musician, and Norman Mailer, the writer. So what did we learn from the world's greatest uh, longitudinal study of human development? Uh, cigarettes are really, really bad. So of all the things you can do, smoking cigarettes is just guaranteed to be terrible. Drinking too much is really bad too. So here's two things that you don't have to do and if you don't do them you're probably gonna have a much better life and these the impacts of these were followed over a 50 year time span. Depression uh, is and depression and alcoholism are separate illnesses and uh, they're both really bad. Money can't buy happiness or success. Uh, some of the wealthiest people were the most miserable in the end, and some of the poorest were the happiest. Childhood relationships matter a lot. So you can imagine that they followed these men up until their 80s. Uh, some of them are still alive. Uh, and But they knew when they interviewed them when they were 19 years old at Harvard uh, what their relationships with their parents were. And they uh, studied these men constantly over the intervening 50 years and they found that one of the strongest determinants of who they became was the relationships they had with their, their parents and their teachers. Uh, the, the most uh, adjusted, best adjusted of them kept learning all through life. Some of them changed careers, uh, were always open to new things in, in different ways. Uh, so the main conclusions of the grant study, stop smoking, drink less, exercise more, seek and maintain loving relationships, don't worry about money, know that you can keep growing until you die. And he was interviewed just a few years ago and he's trying to boil it down even more. And he says the 75 years and 20 million dollars expended on the grant study points to a straightforward five word conclusion. Happiness is love, full stop. And for you Christians out there, uh, God is love and love is God. So uh, the, one of the greatest uh, medical scientific studies of all times by this eminent uh, Harvard psychiatrist comes to the same conclusion that many of us came to when we encountered the Bible and fellow Christians, which is that happiness is love. So on that note, I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you very much.